is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magicians, Season 2, Episode 2, Hotel Spa Potions. In this episode, Penny gets his hands fixed, and unsurprisingly, Marina is not initially on board with helping Julia. I appreciate her having a change of heart, but honestly, Beast, what are you doing? Welcome to Spoil Me. the show everybody i am natasha so yeah guys this episode is uh kind of an i don't want to say an intermission because that makes it sound like nothing happens but it's definitely like less intense action wise and it's a lot more like research heavy and figuring things out and looking into um you know avenues for action and this applies both to the Break Bills crew that is doing their research in an actual library, and it also applies to the king of shit, who is uh, out here doing some very important, but also very undignified, depending on how you look at it, type of work. And it is just so amusing to me, and I love it. So the episode starts off with the crew going back to break bills and running into the Dean who is waiting for them, unsure whether or not they're even alive. And when they get to the fountain to return to break bills, the crew that normally keeps on like, uh, you know, trying to kill them or steal things like buttons from them or whatever, simply stands and watches them and doesn't actually like make any trouble and they all sort of wonder what the fuck because they think that there's maybe a trap set here but penny is the one who's just like well if you guys just want to stand here and wonder about it go ahead i'm out and we see the dean when like standing or sitting on a bench at the spot that they wind up coming out and he has been casting he's doing something that i'm like not sure but i i think we're supposed to assume is meant to be holding those people back. I don't exactly know. Um, but they wind up getting through and he is very, very happy that it turns out that they are all alive. What a surprise. Um, so they start talking to him about what they found, the book in the palace that is a workbook from Break Bill's. And asking about battle magic and where the hell they can find the information. And he admits that there was a teacher named Bigsby who tried to tell him that battle magic was hugely important. And he wound up like firing that teacher and like removing them from the grounds. And it's really like, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Um, oh, maybe Hugabug says, I thought they didn't attack because of the beast's contract with Julia to do no harm to any of her friends. I forgot that they were under contract to the beast. So maybe that's what it is. And maybe what the Dean was doing with his casting was simply making sure that whenever they came out from the other side, they came out near where he was sitting. That would make sense. Thanks, Hugabug. Um, so... Bigsby, we find out later, is a pixie. And so very into riddles and games and whatnot. This is a trope that I always enjoy um, as much as it can be kind of tedious, especially if it's a puzzle that's like virtually impossible for a reader slash viewer to work out. Um, But a lot of the times it's done so that you can sort of play along. And I find that very enjoyable. And I I like it. There's a couple of different things with um, the Dresden Files in which he'll get into a kind of a hairy situation 
involving some fairies and creatures of fairy. And they're vicious. Like, they love blood. They love hurting things for fun. And he will get himself out of it by turning what's initially just a bloodbath for the sake of it into a game in which there are stakes. And one of the stakes is, if I win, I get to walk away. And it's really smart. It's a great way to handle things. And it's also, you know, because he knows that they kind of can't resist. They just love games so much that they would be willing to give up on their prize if it meant that they got some entertainment out of it in the meantime and also got to, like, show off their ingenuity regarding setting up riddles and all of this stuff or solving them. So... Bigsby has like the last words that she said as she was being escorted off the campus was that battle magic was one day going to be totally necessary and by then it would be their last hope. And we find out that last hope is actually a book in the library, but they can't find it. And there's a, like, well, they, they find the book, but there's like a chapter ripped out of it. And in order to find it, they have to solve the riddle that's inside that book. And uh, there it's it goes on and on with like trying to track down exactly where Bigsby is. And one of the clues is an island made of streets, which Margo's immediately like, what, Rhode Island? And I really like that because... Later on, it turns out, as she puts it, that was beginner's luck, that she, like, got that one bit, and it makes it seem like, for a second, maybe she's just a riddle genius, you know? But it's just how riddles work. There are moments where something is phrased in such a way that it just clicks right into place with how your mind works, and you get that bit. And then another bit, which seems totally clear to somebody else, you're like, just... Is that, does that even make sense? Meanwhile, to the other person, of course it makes sense. It makes so so much sense that they thought of it without even like having to try. Um, which I think that's what's awesome about riddles is trying to force your brain to work in a whole other way. Um, because, you know, we were really good at that once upon a time. And as we get older, it's a, ha- a lot harder for us to let go of linear thinking. Um you got to go lateral sometimes, guys. So they wind up tracking Bigsby down. Um, Matthew is here. Oh, you know what? I just realized that I never said thank you to Nicole who commissioned this episode. I'm so sorry, Nicole. I was so distracted with like wanting to talk about this because it's been about two weeks, I think. Um, since this episode fell on a Friday and the last one was last week on Monday, it's been a minute. So I was just a little over eager. But yeah, thank you so much to Nicole for commissioning this episode. Um, and Nicole saw that I was like desperate for another episode of uh, Killing Eve because there wasn't one commissioned. So she commissioned another episode of The Magicians, but then another one of Killing Eve, even though she hadn't watched it yet, which huge thank you because that show is real, real good. And I'm very eager to get to another episode of it. Um, so, oh, Nicole's here. Hi, Nicole. Yeah, sorry, lady. I'm like 10 minutes into this and I didn't even say thanks. Um, So, okay. They go to Bigsby's and she is adorable. Uh, It's a really tricky thing to make a character like this who isn't super irritating. Um, I'm sure that y'all know what I'm talking about when you when you first run across a character that is meant to be sort of light and bubbly and fun and certain actors can't help but make that obnoxious. And it's not always true. And it depends on the actor and it depends on their interpretation. It also, of course, depends on the writing and the way their lines are written. Um, and this show, thankfully, really tends to shy away from anything a little too twee, you know? So in that way, she doesn't wind up pushing my buttons. Um, but... The the introduction that we have is the dean coming to her door and her immediately like throwing her arms around him and giving him a kiss 
and it's like a really intimate kiss and he tries to like at first be like no 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 but then as she's kissing him his like no 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 turns into <laughs> and i loved that so much like because this pixie and her like you know proclivities um she's clearly somebody who was like i don't even want to say promiscuous because that's no not totally clear i'm assuming so but she's definitely somebody who's like very comfortable with her sexuality um and there are a lot of times where this sort of behavior is treated as charming and funny especially when another character isn't exactly receptive to it. Like it's fun to see somebody being uncomfortable who's normally very self-possessed. So I could see it being sort of tempting to make it like the Dean keeps on being basically harassed by her and is trying to talk to her about like ordinary things and is not receptive and she's being too pushy. And once upon a time that could have been seen as funny and just sort of like, oh, his ex is, is like really into him and he's obviously into her, but he's also like uncomfortable. But I feel like we've really turned a corner as a society and we're really starting to see even when it's a woman doing this stuff, even though we're flipping around what the gender expectation is, it's still like sexual harassment and really not OK. And if somebody's making it clear that they don't welcome this sort of attention and behavior back off, you know? So what they did was have the Dean for a minute be like, I'm just here to talk to you. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, damn. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, you real good at this shit. And being a little bit distracted. And when she brings up like having sex underneath this tree and how the grass feels on your ass, he isn't even like, don't talk about this. He's just kind of like, girl, look, can we just have something that's just ours? Like, don't do this now. All right, we'll talk about that later, though. I promise we'll talk about it. Maybe we can do it again. It's fine. So I think that they really straddled that line really well. And also, I enjoy seeing the Dean let loose a little bit because as much as he will swear and be like really, you know, unfiltered with his opinions on things, seeing him like sort of given to his baser instincts in this moment humanizes him for me a little bit because he can be so rigid and stiff, you know? So I really enjoyed this. And I thought that the way she acted this scene makes it a lot less like creepy because the tendency towards having a bubbly fun character that oftentimes is like related to fairy or some in that like sort of neighborhood, a lot of characters tend to play that like very childlike and that is a valid thing you can do. And it doesn't always have to come across as creepy, but y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like it can though frequently it's actually a bit of a trope. I'm pretty sure it's on TV tropes. The like childlike woman character whom an, a male character falls in love with. And there's a real ick factor there to me because it just falls like it really dovetails with men wanting to date much, much younger women. It's are you attracted to people who just don't know any better and put up with your bullshit because they're not aware they can do better or are better than you or whatever? And so, yeah, anyway, I'm just going on and on about this. But I was a very, I was real leery when I found out that she was a pixie and we were going, I was just like, oh, what are we doing? Um, and there's also genuine chemistry be her, between her and the guy who's playing the Dean. So that helps as well. Um, so he tells her that the people that he has brought with her, and this is, Alice and Quentin. Um, he says, these are my students. They're in need of the Rhineman Ultra, which guys, I don't know who came up with this name, but it sounds like a razor blade factory brand name. Like, doesn't it? 
Rhineman Ultra. It's like a big, a, an unfiltered cigarette or like a fucking can of beer or something. Who came up with this? It's just so, it it's so soulless. It's so generic. It could, you know, I don't know. Um, but anyway, she laughs and is like, oh, really? I kind of remember telling you that this was going to be a necessary thing. And y'all told me that I was full of shit and kicked me out. And yet here you are. And she winds up dragging, dragging this whole thing out. It's so wonderful, y'all. She says something about how you look hungry because she's going to sort of prolong this whole thing, right? And she goes and gets a plate of food for them. Now, I don't know exactly what's on that plate because it passes by so very quickly, but it looks like a pile of cakes, Reese's, uh, not Reese's, um, Rice Krispie Treats, brownies like it looks like just a bunch of sugar which again i love this trope that they're that like fairies and pixies just love sugar it's just very amusing to me and her coming in and putting this like pile of of sweets down and being like you seem hungry i don't know about y'all but when i'm hungry that's not what i want and it, but it also looks so pretty. She has it like all teared up with the colors very interspersed. And it's on this like lovely cake tray or uh, cake stand. Um, and yeah, then she starts talking about how humans um, tend to have panic and paranoia. Um, and that if they hadn't been so worried about it, they would have just gone ahead and listened to her about the battle magic to which the dean is like, yeah, uh, you know, a bunch of kids died the year that you were in school. And she's like, yeah, they did way fewer than in the 1920s or in the 60s. Like, you know, she, kids are gonna die. Magic is dangerous. You can't avoid that. And getting rid of battle magic, that's not solving anything. It's just creating a, an entire generation of ignorant kids. And it's interesting how much this argument is sort of paralleling like sex education, you know, and I feel like that's purposeful, especially given how she how open she is about her sexuality. I feel like there's meant to be a bit of a parallel here with like being overprotective to the detriment of people who need to know, like, sure, do we wish they didn't need to know? Sure. Is it possible that this information will like lead to their curiosity and doing something dangerous. Of course it is, but also that's going to happen anyway. Um, meanwhile, she tucks her hair behind her ears and her ears are pointed, which I didn't expect, even though I kind of should have. And I really liked that little detail. Cause it's not like it's not her, her ears aren't so pointed that it's like obnoxious again. It's not something that it's just like, oh, my God, but it's just this little detail. And she has like a leaf necklace on. There's a lot with her look that's very subtle. But, you know, her home is full of light. There's plants everywhere. There's just a lot about this that's fun and uh, feels modern. And the show tends to be pretty good at that. And she zeroes in on Alice and is like, so I could give you this power, but anybody else it would burn to a crisp. And even you, it's sort of waning. So if I give this to you, you're going to have to be the one to do it because, and and you're going to have to do it quickly because otherwise you're not going to be able to handle this. And she asks her whether or not she boned a God. She figures out that that's probably where it comes from. And of course, assumes that this was like a consensual encounter and that the sex must have been amazing. And, that is not how it was. Poor Alice. Bless her. Um, so, yeah, he tries to <laughs> tries to say, well, if you could just give us the spell, he being the dean. And she's like, well, you guys need to convince me. And she sort of sits back and lets them do that. Lets them try to convince her. Um, and Quentin is realizing that she is the one who gave Rupert Chatwin the battle magic that 
changed the like the tide of a war in the Battle of the Bulge, um, and that she's basically changed human history. To which she's like, "Oh yeah, a lot of times I've done that." And this is when she starts talking about the juniper tree. It has the softest grass. Um, and she starts talking about this. And I really thought, and I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Um, oh, sorry, guys. There are people in the chat. Jesse says, I love all the practical effects and makeups in this season. I want all the makeups and wardrobe in this season, says Nicole. Um, and Jesse says, wardrobes. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of really great outfits just so far. And this is only episode two. This must have been a really fun show to do this for because, you know, period clothing is fun, but you do have to obey rules and be careful, depending on how much you're willing to push the envelope of what was extant at that time. And I think being able to do something like this, where you get to play with a historical look here and there, but you really get to do it in a modern setting is kind of ideal, you know, getting to modernize something and, and really when it comes down to it, design clothing that you would want to wear, you know? Um, but anyway, so when she's talking about this tree and the grass, I really thought this was part of her game. Like what it seems like at this point is that she was just talking about all of this to sort of distract them. And at the time I thought, Maybe you guys should pay attention because she's trying to tell you where to find it. Like the juniper tree on campus is a location. It could be that she's actually giving you like a clue here, even though it seems to you like just silly rambling talk. But then she winds up just giving them the spell a little bit later. And it sort of shot a hole in my theory, but I'm kind of also low-key waiting for that to wind up being something anyway um so she's you know kind of waiting for them to just sort of get on their knees and beg and the dean stands up at this point kind of with this attitude like he's realizing she does not plan to be reasonable and he is thinking that maybe they should just leave because she's not going to help. And once he does that, she sort of reconsiders and she gets up, she has a napkin laying there and she like shakes it out. And all of a sudden the spell is written on the napkin and it's beautiful. Of course it's done in this really cool way. And she tells Alice, nobody can be within 20 feet of the blast. It will kill anyone, including your beast. And as soon as she says that the camera focuses in on Quentin and I didn't even think of it. I am ashamed to say, because I was like, why is he getting so angsty about this? She didn't say you can't be within. She's just like, you know, like she isn't saying everybody is going to die if you're not careful. I mean, she is, but there's something about it, about his reaction that really made it sound like she's giving you very clear instructions. There really shouldn't be anything to worry about. Just do that. And it turns out later, obviously, he's worried about Julia because he knows that she's with the beast now. Didn't even think of it. Didn't even enter my head. I felt kind of bad about it. Um, and we see Alice, who is practicing outside later, trying to get the spell right. And even though she has the ability, it's not easy. She's not like taking to this with a a sort of inherent understanding. It's going to be a minute before she has this mastered. And in that time, her own strength that was given to her by the gods is going to start to fade away. And they're all kind of worried about whether or not she's going to manage this in time. So let me go to the prep scene between all of our break bills crew and the Dean tells them that they're all going to need to get drunk. And don't worry, I am going to go back and talk about Elliot. Everybody calm down. Um, but the, he says, you're going to want to get drunk. They all ask why. And he's like, you'll see. And then the next thing that we see 
is Margot low-key screaming as somebody essentially tattoos her. It's not a tattoo, though. It's like a blade. It's like they're just cutting into her. And it's, like, really, really bloody, guys. It's pretty awful. And the person doing this is really just dead and totally unfazed by the screaming. And I just really wonder how you do that sort of job. <laughs> like, damn, that's harsh. Um, and she gets up and she's obviously like the last one to go. I don't know how the rest of them are even wearing clothes because it feels like it should be impossible to like even wear a shirt over that. But the Dean says, now time for the painful part. And Margot, of course, that wasn't the painful part. And he's like, oh, no. And he has the Professor Lee go over to a fire. And I was like, what? Is there a brand? But he's like doing this weird thing. And then he pulls out what I thought was going to wind up being like a salamander. He calls it a cacodemon. It is the weirdest little creature. It's basically a slug with arms that looks like a live coal. And they each get one. And the insignia on the backs, like uh, the, the tattoo that they got on their backs, I don't know if it's just for this or if there are other benefits to that. But this like creature is placed on Quintin's when we watch this ceremony. So it's almost like that's like an opening or a uh, portal for it to get inside. And it has to be dropped onto his back and absorbed into him. And in that time, like once it's inside, it seems like the pain pretty much dissipates. But initially they have to like just bear through it as it is absorbed into their body. And the Dean tells them, you're going to learn a word to control your caco demon. And when you get a chance to use it, be aware you get one shot. This is a creature that you can only use one time. So pick your moment with care. Now, this is one of those things that I understand for. <sighs> What's the wording I want here? For the sake of drama, how about that? As writers, you need to make sure it's a surprise how this works. And I don't mean the installation of the creature into a body. I mean what it looks like when this creature is fired, for lack of a better word, from the body like a gun. But goddamn do I wish that there were more moments where this sort of thing was like handed over this sort of weapon and the person doing the handing over was like, okay, so when you use it, this is what's going to happen because so many books, TV shows, movies, you name it, they give them a weapon and they're like, this is a pretty big one. So, uh, you know, be careful with it. They don't actually tell them what it does. They don't actually tell them like the recoil might literally break your arm. Or if you're not careful about where you aim it, you could put a hole in six buildings. Like they just give it and try and say it's pretty powerful. Like that's actually going to tell you anything. And the fact that he hands over these bizarre creatures and is like, all right, so, you know, you're going to use a word, make sure to be careful, you only get one shot, and doesn't tell them what the fuck this is going to do when you pull the trigger, irritates me so much. Tell them, dude, what happens? Where does it come from? First of all, I assume it's going to be released from their bodies and go shooting at its, like, at, a, at the enemy, but maybe it won't. Maybe it'll possess your body for a moment. Maybe it'll give you a sudden power that you didn't have before. And then what happens after that one shot is used up? Do you vomit it up? Does it come pouring out of your fucking back? Do you shit it out? Does it like shrivel up inside you and just fucking like you hawk it up the way that a an owl does with like bones? Does it seep out of all of your pores like 
there is so much about how this works. And I know we're going to find out, but I just hate that people don't communicate because we want there to be a dramatic moment where a thing we never expected works in a way we hadn't imagined. I know it's fun to watch, but just talk to each other, guys. Don't do this. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, we... Uh, he says, what are you going to do with it? Quentin does. And he says, lift your qu shirt, Quentin, and turn around. And Margot just gets this look on his face or her face and says, those words never lead to anything good. And then says, well, almost never. So, yeah, this thing is dropped on Quentin's back and it essentially looks like his flesh is being burned open. And it drops through his skin, the tattoo on his back, like in flames. And I mean that in the most literal flame sense. But then the creature disappears and it returns to just looking like ink. Um, so, yeah, that's that. That's how that's going. So let's back up a little bit. That's pretty much the end of our hangout with uh, that crew, other than what happens with Penny, which I'll talk about right now. So Penny, obviously, is having some fucking issues with his hands. And Sexy Librarian, it, I can't remember this teacher's name, guys, so help me out if you remember. Um, oh, Nicole says the tattoo is basically a cage or entrapment and the words are the keys to the cage. Interesting. Okay, that's cool. Um, this lady is kind of growing to be my favorite. It's... Guys, listen, these sorts of scenes are often very silly. And I have to admit, these two have some real chemistry and this was pretty sexy, actually. So she's working on Penny's hands. She has figured out that there is this spell that requires him to have his hands out of sight. He can't look at his hands for at least 12 hours. And she has this ointment and it is supposed to keep the blood circulating, but also take away some of the discomfort because obviously having your hands bound behind your back is kind of uncomfortable for just, you know, half an hour, never mind 12. So she starts to come up to him and he's protesting because he, for some reason, doesn't trust that this stuff is going to do what she says. I don't really know why. But she uses it on his hands and he immediately goes, oh, oh, and he gets a look on his face. And the way that she's like rubbing his hands, you can tell that he's sort of like, yeah, all right. Yeah, all right. All right. All right. So then he says, I'm wondering if maybe you could rub a little into my shoulder. I, yeah, I got a cramp. And she asks which one with this look on her face. And you can tell she knows that he is just so full of shit right now. And he says both, actually. And she comes around and gives him a look and then begins to unbutton his vest. Because really... When it comes down to it, with Penny, if you ever need to get access to his bare chest or shoulders, it's minimal effort. He's going to be halfway there already. She needs to unbutton two buttons, and then he's basically naked from the waist up. It's really funny to me. But she goes and gets this ointment, and she rubs it into his shoulders as he is kneeling and bound in front of her. And this is a real, like you know, dumb moment. It's pretty great. I love her. And she, as she is rubbing it in, he says, I feel guilty. I'm letting you do all the work. And she says, I don't mind and comes and kneels in front of him. And he says, still, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. And she says, I don't think you're in a position to do much. And he gets really close, like he's about to kiss her, and says, try me. And she says, I might. And then stands up and says, 
after you graduate and kisses him on the head and walks away. And honestly, good for her because first of all, don't fuck students, teachers, just a good rule of thumb. Listen, I understand that there are going to be temptations and people who are very willing and that's going to happen, but just don't do it anyway. Just like I said, rules to live by. There are a few and that's one of them. But also let's go from just a pure like personality perspective Penny does tend to seem to like to use sex to run away from stuff. And I feel like denying him this is probably for his own good. I don't really have any like theories on that. I don't have any real evidence to support it. But there is just something about his attitude most of the time that makes me think, Fucking a student would just make him so much more irritating to be around. Or fucking a teacher, sorry. Um, But later on, when she undoes his hands, it seems like they are right back to normal. And thank God for that, because I was just getting a little bit tired of that subplot. (laughs) So, okay. Now, I'm going to back up and talk about Julia. This beast is so annoying. All he's doing is wandering around singing and it's about love and trust and whatever. Oh God. And like, at least he's got a decent voice, but somehow that just makes it more annoying because it feels like he's singing to hear himself sing. Like he's really, it like, it feels masturbatory. Does that make sense? I don't know. Maybe I'm projecting. Um, But yeah, he is the worst. And he's talking with Julia about, because she's like trying to write this um, symbol to do the summoning. And he's looking at it and says, this is way too similar to the one that you originally used. He's going to know that's you. Like he'll know it's a trap and he'll be ready and there'll be a whole you know, he'll come, basically he'll come in prepared to fuck your shit up again. Um, And she asks if he has a better idea. And he's like, well, no, first of all, if I had an idea and I tried to give it to you, part of what attracts him to you, as he puts it, is your primitive purity. And If I influence you too much, it's going to contaminate that and he isn't going to want to come to you. Um, And he says that you just need to sort of like accept things the way that I have. And she asks what he means. And he says essentially that life is pointless and that we invent all of these silly things to be worried about to just fill in the time before we die. And gets talking about, like, you know, revenge and wanting to, like, figure out who slept with who and all of this stuff, when really, in the end, it doesn't matter at all. And he mentions something about royalty. And she says that, you know, me and my friends are going to be, which I really, Julia, girl, do you really think after what you just did? You're going to be royalty in Fillory? Like, girl, where in the fuck have you been? Why do you think that's something for you? What? Sweetie, honey, no. And at this point, you know, I still could see Margot or Alice dying and her winding up taking their place. But I don't want that to happen. And I feel like it would be... Oh. Uh, just a little bit too easy. I think that, you know, there has to be a consequence for everything that's happened here. I understand that she was deceived. You know, this isn't exactly her fault in the, like it, but she is responsible is really the thing. There is a difference between it being your fault and you being responsible, which is a, a, a nuance that I think is lost on a lot of people. Um, 
I, I feel like the word blame or fault gets tossed around a lot. And they, in my opinion, don't mean the same thing. This is your fault means that you went against either your own better judgment or the advice of a lot of people around you whose opinion you should have trusted and whose opinion you should have given more weight. And you went and did whatever the fuck you wanted despite their warnings or despite the feeling in your gut that told you this was a bad idea. And now this thing has happened and you don't have like you acted like a child and the consequences are due to your faults because of being immature or whatever. Now we are in a gray area. As I say that I'm realizing that like Julia did kind of have a gut feeling that something wasn't right about this, but everybody around her was telling her that it was fine, that they felt great and blessed that there was a, like, you know, we have, um, what's her name? Katie? Is that her name? Who's, you know, had this, like, weight in her chest that is finally relieved for the first time in, like, forever. Um, there is, there are people around her, including Richard, who have more experience in magic than she does and are also fooled. So... She goes against her gut instinct, but be that is because she is honoring the opinions of people who know better. So most of the time, I feel like that tends to be a smart move because we just don't know that much. And deferring to folks with more experience is usually smart. So I just have a really hard time saying it's her fault. I just I think it's it's her responsibility and it's different. Um. But anyway, yeah, he tells her at this point about how he put a little bit of a curse on the castle. Not even a curse. He winds up telling her and we get a really weird look at Fillory like floating in the air. Um, <laughs> flat earthers are going to love this. But yeah, we get to see the castle. There's like crystals a atop each of the spires and the spires look very dick like, by the way. I don't know if that's anything specific but they are led to the throne room and the stench in here is apparently really terrible and we see that Elliot assumes it's dead rats but then they uncover a couple of bodies that have spears and axes through them and we go back to the beast and he's telling Julia that the gods, Umber and Ember, I think, they made it impossible for him to retake the throne. And the children of Earth kept coming and coming, drunk on self-love and power lust. I thought of it as a kind of a royal test that no one ever passed. And this is very reminiscent of the curse that Voldemort places on the dark arts job, right? Which is it, like, I really particularly like it in Voldemort's case, because it turns out that he didn't even want the dark arts job. Really? He just wanted an excuse to be in the castle, but he had such a sense of entitlement to the position that the fact that he wasn't hired made him so bitter and angry that he decided to curse it, even though he didn't actually really even want it, which is just a great, I just love that as a character thing. And uh, I'm not, I don't know the beast well enough here to know if he really wanted to be on the throne again or not. I assume by the point that he was like banned from coming back, that he didn't really want it anymore, that he had moved on to other things. But the fact that he has done that, that and we don't ever find out because he says it's a test and Julia asks what kind of test. And he says, uh, that's for each despot to find out themselves. Um, and we see them like clearing out the throne room, removing bodies. There are the four thrones sitting on the, like the dais and they're a couple of them are knocked over. They're covered in dust. And they do also just look like ordinary chairs, Rather than being like particularly impressive thrones, 
they just sort of look like 80s style dining chairs, weirdly. Um, so, yeah, he says that it that the test is something for them to puzzle out themselves. And then he distracts Julia again and says, you're on the right track. We just need the bait. And she asks, well, she, of course, assumes I'm the bait. And he's like, no, dude, he's already had you. We need somebody fresh that he doesn't, that he hasn't had access to. And I know of somebody. And he says, she's young, beautiful, female, and a very powerful witch. And immediately I'm like, are you fucking talking about Marina? You cannot do this. Are you serious? She just helped her out. What are you doing? And there is something about Julia's response to him saying this. Uh, I do believe that she'd react this way to him saying this at all. Because he's basically being like, we're going to offer up some other poor girl potentially to be raped if this all goes wrong, but almost definitely to be killed at the very least. But I kind of wonder if Julia doesn't also think of Marina when he says this. Um, but whatever the case, he winds up going out and getting Marina and dragging her back. And Marina, for her part, is completely not on board with this at all. He has her in a luchador mask, which... I don't know, but that's so, like, perfect in its way. But, yeah, he's got her all gripped up. And I just feel so bad for Julia in this moment. I, of course, feel bad for Marina. That's just a foregone conclusion. But in this moment, there's something about how fucking guilty you'd feel if you were Julia and this person had been the only one around to help you through one of the worst moments of your entire life. And they wound up being dragged back to be used as bait ostensibly at your behest. That's a, like, I would be so ashamed. I would be so fucking disgusted with him and angry at myself, even though I had nothing to do with it. I, I would still be, you know, um, and Marina is absolutely not interested in helping the beast for his part is, you know, somebody that she just doesn't want to be involved in, but she also, you know, the, the whole idea of getting involved with something that she was basically kidnapped for and lending it a, a sort of, What's the word I want? I think that she is too headstrong. That even though we find out later, she knows that Julia is right about everything. She cannot allow this to stand. This abduction and attempt to coerce her into helping. We know who Marina is. She isn't going to go along with things when this is how they start. And I don't blame her at all. Like, I am a very similar way. I have a reaction to being told that something is mandatory or expected. It's just innate in me. I am a defiant person. You tell me I can't do something and I'll go do it. Even if it is a fucking self-destructive thing to do. Because you said I can't and fuck you. You don't get to tell me what to do. And it's just in me, you know, and that's clearly how Marina works. She got kicked out of break bills, you know, like she is not somebody who likes to take instruction or advice or be told what to do. And <laughs> this is also the reason why I work for myself. I can be a model employee for up until a certain point. And then all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I'm actually better at this than both of you who are my bosses. Why am I even listening to you? Inevitably, I wind up getting there. And then my work starts to suffer because I have all this resentment. So, yeah, she is. I knew at this point that she was going to come back and that she was going to agree to help. But she needed to figure it out for herself. She needed to, like, be able to say it was her decision to help and not that she had been forced to. So she 
gets in touch with this other witch as she's leaving because finally, I, and I really appreciate it. Julia, of course, is desperate for her help, but is unwilling to make her stay. So when she finally is like, I'm not helping, Julia says, all right, fine, go, you know, like, what can I do? Um, and she said, she says sooner or later, Julia says, he is going to find you. We need someone. And she says, else, Julia, or we have a problem. Do you want a problem with me? It's such a good line. So she leaves, but on the way out, she calls somebody else. I don't feel like we've seen this other person before. Correct me if I'm wrong, this other woman. Um, but she gets on the phone and is immediately like, you know, this bitch might be extremely irritating and crazy, but she isn't wrong. And you know, she isn't wrong. There is something happening and we need to get ahead of this. And she's saying that she's on the phone looking at a news article that says five Florida women slaughtered hearts removed by possible ritualistic killer. I assume that this is another one, not the one that, you know, Julia and the beast had been investigating earlier, but it might be the same one. Um, and she says, I know we made a pact. I stick to my coast. You stick to yours. But, you know, th this might take all of the hedge bitches to uh, coven up and take this asshole out. Like, this could be all of us. And this lady seems to realize that it's a just a necessity that all of them wind up banding together here and says yes. Um, there was a part of me that kind of wondered if she wasn't saying yes to Marina to set up a trap for her. But Marina winds up going to her office on the West Coast, I'm guessing. And she uh, tells her the... She when she gets through the door, because this woman, like, I think that's the last we see of her talking. Oh, Huggabug says, no, she's new. OK, cool. Um, that I think that's the last we see of her talking because then Marina comes through the door and her heart's been ripped out already. And this is the thing, because we had seen that these other five people had been uh, getting like the assertion from the beast is that these are people who are worshiping. Our Lady Underground, who is a draw for him. I can't remember the name of the, the god. Um, but he seems to be like drawn towards people who are worshipping. And I'm unclear if Our Lady Underground is just not real. Like he is Our Lady Underground, basically. And it is a fake God that he created as a mask for himself. Or if Our Lady Underground is real and he is like her opponent somehow, because gods have feuds, like according to legend. Um, but in any case, I really thought that you needed to be like actively drawing his attention in order to cause him to come after you. And when Marina walks through and sees this woman, I was really surprised. Reynard, thank you, Uggabug. Um, I was really surprised because she's just sitting at her desk like she wasn't doing any sort of ritual, but he came at her anyway. And I'm curious as to how he picked her out. Like, did he hear the phone call that Marina, like, and she, this woman just happened to be in a spot where he could come and attack her, whereas Marina's been on the move all day traveling, and so he couldn't pin her down. Um, I don't know what it is that draws him after all, because I thought I kind of did, and it seems not. So anyway, um, she winds up turning around and going back and showing up at Julia's door and being like, all right, here we go. And uh, I really enjoy the two of them sharing a cigarette while this fucking guy is dancing around. Oh my God. I hate him so much. I hate him. <sighs> and he says, don't keep me waiting. Ladies, are we going to kill a God? And Julia says, yeah, for starters. Um, oh, he's so annoying. I love that. They found a way to make him insufferable in a very human way. He's like having a really bad roommate, you know, 
Uh, and the look that Marina has as she's looking at him with the cigarette in one hand and her eyebrows up and her just like glaring. That is so funny to me. All right. So we're going to go back to what's going on with Elliot because it turns out like he's first of all worried about the throne room and he's trying to create some champagne the first time that they've ever done it in Fillory, apparently. Spoiler alert, it does not come out good. And his wife is being pretty patient here. And she tries to humor him, I think, for lack of a better word. Um, because he is... What, what she is seeing is somebody who is being very callous because his people are suffering and what he is giving a shit about is making champagne, which for her is just so gross and unforgivable. But we know that he is unaware of what's happening. So she's really judging him right now, but it's not entirely fair. And this, because she's judging him, she's also sort of assuming that he's going to be crueler to her than he is if she steps out of line in terms of as she puts it being obedient and she's just got a whole wrong idea about who he is um and he tells her i'm okay with being king but i don't want to run a cult and if anyone has a right to speak up it's definitely you. Like, you have to live with me. And you just got, like, handed off to me, you know? So she says there hasn't been a truly inspiring, caring ruler since Rupert Chatwin. And that was so long ago, most barely remember. And he gets defensive and is like, I'm trying to clean the place up and get wine going. What else is there? And he says it in this really offhand way and she gets a look on her face like she cannot fucking believe what she's hearing and says your people are starving and he gets a look and is like oh what seriously and what it turns out which is just so good and I love this so much what it turns out to be is that previously Fillory just basically was so magical that everything was provided for the farmers and they barely had to actually farm. They were really just harvesters and the land did everything itself. But now that the magic is being leached out of things, they need to supplement the magic by doing their jobs, but they don't know how nobody's taught them. They've never had to worry about it. Surprise, surprise. It winds up coming out. The Elliot grew up on a farm and he is like genuinely having like nausea at some of the memories. It is so funny to me. I love it so much. Oh, Elliot. Listen, I worked on a farm. I really enjoyed it and I miss it all of the time. I really do. But farming ain't no fucking joke. Like if you have never done it before, it is hard to get across the level of work and how constant it is. It, like a farm is like housework, but even dirtier. The proportions of everything are bigger and it's much more unpredictable um, because it's just a cycle that never, ever ends. You are way more at the mercy of the weather. And, it, it, you know, it's just everything is much more backbreaking. <laughs> Um, so, you know, his revulsion at the memories of working on a farm, I'm not mad at him about it. And he winds up having to distribute fertilizer because he says something about sprinkling shit around. And his wife looks at him like, I'm sorry, excuse me? And she real he realizes that she doesn't know what fertilizer is because they've never had to use it. And that's a huge part of the problem. So he has to like drive around and with in this carriage and drop off bags of shit at each of the farmers' farms and tell them to sprinkle it around because they don't know what this is or how to do it. And understandably, they're pretty skeptical. 
So him like sailing up, acting like he's saving them and then literally handing them a bag of shit. They're not super impressed right now. It's later on in the episode. She comes up to him and tells him that everything is working, but it takes a minute for them to really have faith that this isn't just kind of a joke or him just having really poor judgment. Um, and eventually the break bills crew comes back to Fillory and warns him because there's a scene where, uh, and I'm out of time here, so I really got to wrap this, but, um, Quentin goes and talks to Julia and warns her that she needs to be away from the beast when they blow him up. And she's like, you better not fucking blow him up before I get a chance to kill Reynard. And he's like, dude, this guy is going to end magic forever. And he's killed people. And she's like, Reynard is out here killing people right now. What are you fucking talking about? And then threatens him. And Quentin's like, dude, really? I came to warn you. And you're going to say, you're going to talk like that to me? Which honestly, as much as I feel for Julia, and I do really think in the end she's in the right, I saw Quentin's point when he phrased it like that. I was like, yeah, he, she, he's trying to do you a favor, girl. Like, he didn't need to come and try and tell you this. Um, but she tells Quentin in repayment that the Beast has let her know about a kind of curse slash test that he has laid on the castle. And uh, there, like, there is a weird scene with Elliot and his wife because he's, like, decided that he wants to try and be kinky and he isn't actually able to fuck anybody else, but they can be in the room watching and fucking other people while he's fucking his wife, and that's allowed. And she is not totally okay with it. And he decides he's going to try and, like, do things her way because she's not comfortable with it. And I appreciated that he respects that she just isn't down. It's not like what he's doing is harming her in a in a way that's, like, physical. He, he's not asking her to sleep with somebody that she doesn't want to. But he is asking her to participate in a kink that is not her kink. And once he sees that she's, like unhappy and she'll do it because he says but she doesn't really want to he's like all right all right all right no never mind all right everybody go and she also really rightfully points out that all of the dudes that he gathered in tell him he they're okay with this but he's the fucking king and what does he think they're gonna say so really just points out the power dynamic here and the fact that he's taking it for granted that they're being honest when they have no reason to be honest with him. What what are they going to say? No, we really don't want to do this to their king. Um, so, yeah, I'm really liking his wife is what I'm saying. And I'm really enjoying the fact that they're making her a character who, like, stands up to him and tells him to, like, look at some of his choices in a different light. It's a nice surprise because I just didn't really, like, have any. I It wasn't even that I didn't like her. I just she was nothing. You know, she just had no personality yet. So I like the direction this is going in. Um, so anyway, all right, guys, I'm over time. I got to wrap it up. But I like this episode. So fingers crossed. I feel like we're heading in the right direction. Thank you again so much to Nicole for commissioning this. I really appreciate it. And I will be seeing you all again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>